made it. I never know if I'm going to make it or not. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. We finished last week's message as we were looking into Revelation. And I was praying earlier in the week, God, which direction you want me to go in? What, what, what do you want for this church, these people, those that are watching in, those that are attending? And there was a word that kept coming back into my mind. It was greatness. Greatness. And I said, the only, the only thing I know about greatness is not very much. And it began to spill out. And I began to uh, look around. And I want to continue in our series with David. And I want to look at true greatness. True greatness. God said of his servant David, he's a man after my own heart. And that's how David is known. He's known as king of Israel, yes. But he's more affectionately known as a man after God's own heart. And we're in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 18. We've gone all the way through the uh, anointing of David to be king, the failure of um, Saul in his serving as king. We've gone through the slaying of Goliath, and all of those things are great. And sometimes you and I, we can rise to occasions rather easily. But when we get into the humdrum of servanthood, daily serving, daily doing what is required, it takes a little, little more effort and attention. And I think greatness comes when we're serving daily and we're faithful and we're living the life that God has called us to live. That's where we are with David right now. Verses 5 through 16, I know that that's uh, a, a little bit of Scripture, but follow along if you would, reading from the NIV. Whatever mission Saul sent him on, David was so successful that Saul gave him a high rank in the army. This pleased all the troops and Saul's officers as well. When the men were returning home after David had killed the Philistine, which is Goliath, the women came out from all the towns of Israel to meet King Saul with singing and dancing, with joyful songs and the trembles and, and the lyres. As they danced, they sang, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. Saul was very angry at this refrain. It displeased him greatly. 
They have credited David with tens of thousands, he thought, but with me only thousands. What more can he get but my kingdom? And from that time on, Saul kept a close eye on David. The next day, an evil or depress, depressing or distressing or harmful spirit from God came forcefully on Saul. He was prophesying in his house while David was playing the lyre, as he usually did. Saul had a spear in his hand. And he hurled it, saying to himself, I'll pin David to the wall. But David eluded him twice. Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with David but had departed from Saul. So he sent David away from him and gave him command over a thousand men. And David led the troops in their campaigns. In everything he did, he had great success because the Lord was with him. When Saul, when Saul saw how successful he was, he was afraid of him. But all Israel and Judah loved David because he had led them in their campaigns. It makes you want to question how do you measure greatness? What makes one person great and another person not great or less than great? Is true greatness seen in the amount of monies that a person has accumulated? So if he's rich, he's great. Can it be determined by the car that they drive or the size of the house that they live in or the status that they have achieved in life, that station? Is true greatness recognizable by one's achievements in his life? For instance, if an actor wins an Oscar, has he or she achieved the status of greatness just because they won an Oscar? If an athlete topples long-standing records, have they achieved greatness? If someone's able to do what has never been done before, climb to the top of a mountain or, or whatever it may be, have they achieved great greatness? Do those acts make someone great? How do you measure that? Now, most of us would look at those kind of things, and most of us would say, well, yeah, that's how you achieve greatness. You do what's never been done. You accumulate great wealth or, or you rise to a high status or you, you be in charge of, of uh, a large corporate, all of those things. And we would say, yeah, yeah. But as I think about that, I have a very sneaky suspicion that God would say, no. No, none of those things will make you great. I think God would say something like, true greatness is not measured by what you have achieved in life, but how you have lived that life. In Job chapter 1 verse 8, we see that God is declaring Job's greatness to Satan. The Lord said to Satan in verse 8, 
Have you considered my servant Job? There's no one like him on earth. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. That's greatness in God's eyes. You and I measure in ways that God doesn't measure. We look at the outward. Remember, that's what God said when Samuel was to anoint David. And Samuel said, surely these older brothers, one of them, because they're, they're big, they're strong. And God said, don't judge by the outward. I judge by the heart. There's a principle that's displayed in the life of David in this passage. David was just a young man. A young lad, if you would. He's a kid fresh from his first battle. But he's already achieved what so few people ever achieve in life. David has achieved true greatness. I'd like to spend a couple of weeks make a few observations with you from the life of David. These observations reveal why I say that David has achieved true greatness. They tell me and you how we too can achieve greatness in God's eyes. And I'd like to take this passage And preach on the subject of true greatness. What does he think about it? So the first thing, point one, is the presentation of David's life. And that comes from 1 Samuel 18, verses 5, verses 14, verses 30. So I'll read those three verses. So David went out wherever Saul sent him. And I'm reading from the New King James Version this time. So David went out wherever Saul sent him and behaved wisely. I I like that. That's in the King James and in the New King James. That he behaved wisely. And Saul set him over the men of war, and he was accepted in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. Verse 14, and David behaved wisely, there it is again, in all of his ways, and the Lord was with him. I don't know that the Lord would be with you If you didn't behave wisely, if you behave like an idiot, why would God hang around? Just ask yourself that. Because sometimes we act like idiots, don't we? God's not going to, no, no. Anyway, verse 30. Then the princes of the Philistines went out to war. So it was where whenever they went out that David behaved more wisely than all the servants of Saul so that his name became highly esteemed or respected by the Philistines. Three times. In the New King James or the King James Version, we're told that David behaved himself wisely or more wisely. This phrase that's used there is a phrase that speaks of someone walking very properly in situations. 
walking very successfully, if you would, through difficult times. It refers to a person who knows how to carry themselves. It, it's more than manners. Manners are not greatness. So it, it supersedes all manners. It speaks of a person who watches what they say and how they say it. What they do or how they act because they know that they are being watched at all times. It's the idea of walking accurately, carefully, successfully in life as if maybe you were navigating a minefield. If you knew that between here and those doors there was mines set, you'd be very careful of how you walked. That's what this word is bringing into the picture. When David acted more wisely or conducted himself wisely. It's the kind of walk that you and I are called to, to, to be on, to display, to show the world. Ephesians 5.15 says, Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. There's three areas where this accurate careful walk of David is on display. Point A is he behaved himself well in spite of life's promotions. Here was a guy that was barely 17 years old. He's out watching his father's sheep suddenly an old man comes up that's got a horn of oil and he dumps it on your head and says, you are king. And most of us would have looked back at him and said, you are crazy. <laughs> Don't dump that oil on my head no more. But David knew that there was something in all of this. But he went right on watching the sheep. He didn't run down to the palace and look at Saul and say, get out. It's mine. It's mine. He just kept watching the sheep like he had done every other day. And his father still told him what to do. And his brothers still picked on him. But David didn't forget. In spite of all the promotions, he stayed true to what God had called him to be and what God called him to do. And then we see his brothers are in battle and he goes to take food to them. And suddenly there's this giant that's standing between them and victory. And David said, I'll take him out of the way. I'll do this. And we know the end of the story. He did. One stone properly placed in the forehead and David went down like a sack of rice. Goliath, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was thinking of the sack of rice instead of <laughs> Goliath. But David 
continued to be a loyal subject day by day to his father, to his king. David did not allow the victory over the Philistines to go to his head and get all puffed up. David knew that he was climbing to the top, but he was willing to go up that ladder one rung at a time. He was willing to climb those stairs one step at a time. For some people, the worst thing that could ever happen to them would be success. Because they begin to think they did it. That there's something special about them instead of about God. If God is calling you to do something, do it humbly. If God's got his hand on you and he's leading you and he's given you a dream, approach it very carefully. Walk wisely into that situation. Nothing's worse than an arrogant person that thinks that they deserve it. But a broken and a contrite heart God will never despise. I want to spend most of my time on my face before God. Not rehearsing all the big things I've done. I want my spirit to remain humble. For that to happen, we have to walk wisely. One of the greatest things that you could do right now, one of the wisest things you could do is surrender your tomorrows to God. Say, God, you be in charge of my life. You lead me down the pathway. I'll follow you wherever you go. David walked wisely. He never let it go to his head. Bow your heads with me, would you please? <clears throat> Father, You've allowed us great victories. God, there's a snare that lays in front of those who have had great victories and is called pride. God, if we've stepped into the shoes of pride, would you forgive us? Let our hearts be humble because if we've done anything in life, it's because you've done it through us. It's not what we've done, it's what you've done. It's not who we are, it's who you are. God, this is a great church, but it's only great because you're in it. And when we walk in, we can feel you right in the middle of it. Oh, how grateful we are for your presence, for your blessings. But not for a moment, God, do we take credit. All credit goes to you. The people are faithful because of you. You have blessed us where we can be. Thank you. Now, God, search our hearts. 
see what's inside of us. And if there's anything there that's displeasing to you, would you put your finger on it? And God, we'll give that away. We'll give that to you. Because it's not us that matters. It's you. I want to walk humbly before you. I want this church to be humble before you. God, thank you for the healings. Thank you for the great deliverances. God, I can name almost eight different times that you've healed cancer in the last five, six years. Healed it. And it's gone. You did that. Thank you. Thank you for everything you do. Now, God, as these folks go through the day, let them continue to search their hearts. We give all those things that are not of you, we give them away. In Jesus' most awesome name, amen. Amen.